All right, I'm Dalton Frazier. I'm Alex Ruiz. I'm Tyler Ross. And this is Bad Tech. So a little bit about myself. My name's Dalton Frazier. I'm going to see you Boulder in the fall to study biomechanical engineering. I'm currently a voice of the cross captain, and I'm a CSWP for solid purpose. I'm Alex Ruiz, and in the fall I'm going to be going to Marquette to also study biomechanical engineering, and I'm the captain for varsity soccer. Um, I'm Tyler Ross. I'm going to CSU Fort Collins. Um, I'm studying biomedical and mechanical engineering, and uh, I also have my CSWP. So for our project, basically, we wanted to create an exoskeleton arm that can assist people that have uh, damage in their arms or just trouble, like maybe an elderly person that like can't do a simple thing like lifting up a coffee mug. And our, uh, the biggest thing we wanted to do was be able to increase strength and increase stability in your arm. And there's a few different components that are gonna go with that. Uh, part of it is the framework, muscles, and coding with that, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Okay, so I'm the muscular specialist, specialty, specialist, sorry, for the project. I focus on the pneumatic muscles, increasing the strength, and just the functionality of it. And then I'm the programming specialist, so like flex sensor servos, that whole aspect of the project. And I do all the framework, which is mostly SolidWorks. As you can see here, that's, a, that's the fully assembled like first model, I think. So I do all the SolidWorks stuff. Okay, so my project objectives were first, I want to get an insight into biomedical or biomedical engineering, because that's the field of study I want to go into. I want to be more knowledgeable about the human body and human anatomy, how the muscles tend and everything work together so this to create this awesome thing that we are. I want to be able to help people with damage to their muscle or their tendons so that they can live better, happier lives. I want to be able to use this project on a resume in the future to help me get a job that I would like. And I wanted to learn more about the engineering process too, so that in the future I can do it more smoothly. Um, for my objectives, I also want to know when I understand what it's like to be a biomedical engineer. And then also further my knowledge in programming. I, I did some programming before, but not um, what this required. And then I want to create a want to create a product that's able to assist people with damage in their arms. And then learn more about the human anatomy and how the arm works. And also be able to use this project in like a future resume. So what I wanted to get out of this project is I wanted to be experienced in the design and manufacturing process. Um, also get an insight to the biomedical and mechanical engineering as I'm going to CSU for those. Um, I wanted to create a functioning arm as I did. And uh, I wanted to use this experience to look towards uh, my future. Um, for our logo, our logo is BET or BT. It's a double entendre. First, it stands for Biomedical Engineering Technologies. But at the same time, it's BET like if there's a difficult task, we bet we can do it. It's kind of cheesy. <laughs> and then that gear on the left represents like the engineering aspect. And then the colors uh, shift from like a light blue all the way to a dark blue to a, a black to represent like the different gradients and different like varieties of medical aspects that we'd be covering. So our expert advisor is Grant McKinney, who's here today. He's a graduate student at the Institute's Medical Campus for CU Denver. He's the president of the Biomechanical Engineering Society down there too. And so he's just a great help to the project and just point us in the right direction. Then my personal support advisor is Ray Reese Soda, who's a good friend and good peer. My brother, McAllister Frazier, who couldn't be here today, but he's in Ohio studying like auto mechanics, so he was also good help. Then my peers, Eilani, who's doing a similar project. So he was good to talk in Floyd and Alec Casillas. Unfortunately, the accident is in the hospital, so he couldn't be here today. But he's a good friend, so keep him, keep him in your prayers. Um, for my advisors, uh, Alex Ruiz Sr., my father, he's a software engineer, so he knows just basics about coding. Then also Reese, he's taking AP classes in physics and calc. So. And then Tyler Takamoto, he's in our senior projects class too. He's a, a pretty qualified programmer. And then Alex Casillas as well, who's in our senior projects class. 
It's like, here's proof. Um, for my support advisors, I have my mom and dad, which is basically, uh, if I need money, they give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also Alex Kizidis, which uh, just like goes over all our papers and makes sure that they're like right. All right, so now we do the bulk of our presentation, the timeline. So in October, we wanted to come together and start just talking about our project and direction we wanted to head. And we were on target with that. We were, in October, we were doing what we expected to. Then in the start of November, I wanted to start researching the different types of artificial muscles, be it pneumatic, which we went with, uh, hot polymers, or mechanical, or some other aspect. And that was a kind of test, but I learned something very important. Home Depot does not always have everything you need. <laughs> we went and created two different Amazon Prime accounts to get the shipping. We have the points. Then, in the start of December, we went to have, we planned on having everything figured out and started building it. And we were a little ahead of that. I started making this thing called the Air Inlet Belt, which gave me more trouble than I would have ever expected. But I'll talk more about that later. So once I 3D printed it, I was trying to make it airtight because 3D printing is not airtight. And then in January, I expected to have like that finish, but instead I was still trying to make it airtight. And then in January, we did the make your presentations. Then I was testing the back muscles without the air that fell because it wasn't coming airtight. I was just giving up on it. And then finally in February, I gave up on the air and about and started researching how to maximize compression, which I'll talk about later. It's a very study by um, Taro Nakamura that I'll talk more about. Then in the start of March, we finally got the muscles working. I figured out how I wanted to orient them on the arm in the way that they are now. I learned about a chain of muscles, which will increase the voice and compression distance, which is in Taro Nakamura's study. And I want to add muscles to Taro's former Alright, so these are the muscles I decided to go with, the pneumatic or air muscles. And they work by silicone and latex tubing being placed in a nylon mesh. And the silicone tubing, when the filled with air expands, the nylon mesh constricts that um, expansion because it can't stretch laterally, only on its axis. So when it compresses, it contracts like so. And they're the most strength that they're causing their weight. So here are my two designs for the air in the ground. This was the original one, and this was the other one. Need a new wire type, and I'll say more about later. Here was a, the just the silicone tubing. This is strength test and showing inflated. And here are two function muscles. Here's it when it's contracted, and here's when it's released. Just to show it lifting the weight on and down. That's a 25 pound weight, moved it to two inches. And then my main setbacks, which were the air in that valve. So here's what I tried doing. I put it in water to allow the air to run through it to see where it bubbled, to see where the leaks were and I couldn't fix it. I eventually covered it completely in hot glue. <laughs> but it wasn't going to work for our project, so we just ended up going without it. I even tried using Flex Seal here, the commercial fly. <laughs> <laughs> and so here's Taro Nakamura's study on contraction distance. So before with a single muscle, I could even contract two inches if the mesh was two inches shorter than the tubing. But that wasn't enough compression to function within our project. So I had to figure out how to expand on that. So I had a great chain of muscles in the cell. And this is what I discovered. That an individual pocket of air can only compress so much. But if there's individual pockets, then it increases the compression force. So each one of these pockets could compress two inches rather than the two inches of the single individual muscle. And here's the relationship between it. Contraction length, the contraction force of the muscle, so basically, the longer the muscle, the greater the force of the contraction. The blue represents the actual muscles, like your physical muscles on your body. So the length of them corresponds to the force that you contract. And here's the artificial muscles. So their length corresponds to their force. And here's the speed. So basically, the longer the muscles and the higher the pressure, the faster they're going to contract, which makes sense. And the main limitations of our project was because we only did the biceps, it can only contract in one way. It can't angle the other way. And the reason we did that is because we thought it was dangerous. Because if we had a tricep and for some reason it contracted too much, you could bend your arm back the other way. And that would just be bad. It's a bossy way to happen. <laughs> and so if we were going to uh, make this product for market, we'd have to get FDA approval. And we need class 3 approval because it's non invasive and there's relatively low risk to the project. So it's the easiest FDA approval to get and be fastest and not too much of a struggle. 
So from our part of the project, it was more the programming aspect. So my biggest question was, how could I use Arduino Flex Sensor Servo to manipulate it so that I can get the uh, arm to move at the user's command? Um, so a lot of my project would depend on how Dom would go about setting up his part of the project. Go back. Um, our first idea was to use this valve, to hook up this valve to the mechanism, then make the servo connect to the valve, and then the servo would spin the valve. This flex sensor right here is what would go on the arm, the actual arm. So when the flex sensor turns, that would make the servo turn, which would make the valve turn, which would allow air to flow in or out. And then, so first, I wanted to just research how the flex sensor would affect the servo. So I found a tutorial on the SparkFun website, and it basically set up this circuit, and it allowed me to see different values of the flex sensor and see how that would make the servo change. And then, so based on that, I was able to develop this code, and it's coded in C++, which can be kind of tricky, but I ended up figuring it out a little bit. Um, I, the base things that I found out was that the servo ranges from 0 to 180 degrees, or 90 degrees in either direction. And then the flex sensor ranges from a value of 600 to 900. And the biggest parts of my code was that it's able to command the servo to move to a certain degree based on the different value of the flex sensor. And then the last part of the code records values. When I hook this up onto the computer, it allows me to see the different values of everything so I can further analyze that. <coughs> and that led me to find out that the, for every one unit of resistance in the flex sensor, it moves the servo 0 0.6 degrees. And this graph kind of shows like the correlation between that. So the significance is that is that um, that means that I'm able to put any kind of servo, no matter what strength or magnitude or what type of servo, and it would still perform the same functions uh, with the same flex sensor, and that came in handy later. Um, and then I needed to create like a wearable sleeve that a person could wear that I could hook up the flex sensor to that would also adjust to any person, which is why I just went for this sleeve. It's like like what a basketball player would use or that kind of sleeve. And then I also needed to increase the length of the wires from the Arduino board, so I just used alligator clips for that. Um, the main setbacks was that valve sensor idea we had initially, um, we ended up not going with that. One reason why was because it would be able to stop the airflow, but it wouldn't release the air efficiently. And also because of the air valve Don was talking about that couldn't work, meant that we couldn't use this method either. But then we also found a more practical method. Um, so instead, what we decided to do is, there's a knob on the air compressor, so we decided to just attach the servo directly onto that knob. So the way that knob works is when it's tightened, it builds the air pressure, and when it's loosened, it releases the air. And yeah, we just attached the servo directly onto it. And then another problem was the servo that comes with the kit was too weak. It wasn't able to completely turn the knob. So then we just ordered a stronger servo from Amazon. And that common ratio I talked about earlier uh, allowed it so that I didn't have to adjust anything in my code. I could just substitute this servo in and it would work just fine. That's the new servo. And then another big issue that I wasn't able to solve was the flex sensor sensitivity. The a quality flex sensor, I was researching the prices that it would be too costly, so I just went with the one that came with the kit. And the one from the kit is not at all sensitive, which means that the servo turns in larger intervals. So instead of reading like one unit of the flex sensor so that it could turn 0.6 degrees, it only reads like every 10 units, so it only turns. Um, 6 degrees instead of 0.6 degrees, so it's not as accurate. Um, for sake of time, I just highlighted the most important parts of my timeline. For the first month of November, the biggest thing 
was just um, researching what kind of code I would need, what materials, and that's when I found out I would need like the servo and everything. So I was up to date with all of that. And then in December, I just dedicated all that to developing my code, and I was able to finish my code in the month of December. And then January, the biggest thing was just uh, fixing my code. We had our mid-year presentations in the middle of January, and then after that, we were just wanting to come back together with the group, and that's when we found out that the valve idea wasn't the right way to go, and we wanted to do the different method instead. And then at, up to that point, my, everything on my timeline was going smoothly, which is actually pretty rare that that happened, so I was pretty content with that. But then month of February is when I started having issues because we decided we were going to do it a different way. So the biggest thing was instead of uh, assembling the final presentation like I was meant to do, I had to find how I would work with this new method and find a way to hook up the servo to the knob directly on the air compressor. And then in March, we were just kind of fixing all that method. And in March, we were supposed to start developing our final presentation, but because of our errors, uh, it was more about just fixing that. I still had to fix the, I still had to fix the flex sensor sleeve and find a way to attach the flex sensor onto the sleeve. And then I also ran into the problem with the servo and I had to find a way to increase the strength of the servo. And then at the end, we are supposed to work on our presentation board and our PowerPoint and everything through the whole month of April, but instead we were pretty much working up until the last day just on finishing the final product. Okay, for my research, I basically only had the research like the mechanics of the arm. So for us, we only did the elbow. There's two motions for the elbow. There's extension, flexion. We can extend it 180 degrees and we can flex it 150. As for the wrist, um, we can uh, we can extend it 90 degrees and, ex and uh, flex it 70. And uh, I also did a little research for the shoulder, but we're not using the shoulder, so that's uh, not really what um, I did a little research on uh, mirroring and assembly for SolidWorks. For my timeline in October, we just figured out what we're doing for our project. We decided on the arm. In November, I was uh, researching the mechanics of the army, like I just mentioned. December, I was uh, actually starting the first drawing of what I wanted it to look like. Um, it's kind of rough. And uh, yeah, I didn't expect it to be. Um, in January, I actually started the SolidWorks modeling. As you can see here, here's one of the braces. Um, I think that's the lower arm brace, so that would go on this part. And this is one of the arcs. Um, that's what like holds it holds it in place on the arm. And all this is going on track, so no setbacks yet. Um, late January, I actually assembled it um, in SolidWorks, as you can see here. It looks pretty good. Um, looks better um, on SolidWorks than it does in person. Um, and uh, everything was going on track. At the end of January, we just uh, meet up and like discuss how our project is going. February, um, I was just starting on like the second prototype, which turned into our like final model, so that's that. We decided to go half scale because full scale doesn't print in the 3D printers. Um, I did a little research on CNC machining, but it turned out we didn't need it, so um, I focused mainly on the 3D printing. And I also started the 3D printing. Um, turned out to be a little more difficult than we thought because um, in the little 3D printers that print the more uh, strong like carbon fiber, um, it was like the layers were like misaligning so it would like mess up our whole print so we had to go with like weaker material. In March we actually got it printed and it's, uh, it's really weak and as you can see, it's really flexible, and that's that's not what we want. So that was a major setback. 
in April, we worked on these changes, and I, uh, I designed a similar uh, design. It consists of more flat pieces and less arcs like this, and uh, that enabled the stronger 3D printer to actually print it and get us what we wanted. Um, as you can see, this is uh, what we got in April. That's it, not assembled. We used lock nuts and bolts and stuff to put it together. That's it on the on the frame right there. So everything went pretty good except the one uh, printing here. Again, the printing here was a major setback and the material strength. The uh, carbon fiber turned out to be a really good option for us. Um, as you can see here, here's my first paper draft. Here's my second paper draft. Here's the first the assembled model in solid groups. There's just some of the individual parts in solid groups. Again. And here's our final thing. Um, we got all of our pieces laid out, unassembled, and then we got the same. Do you have any questions? Um, do you want to show a demonstration? Yeah. yeah sure. So this that that is the six six and a half pounds. One of the problems is that with the servo, in order to make it strong enough to turn, we have to have it a little bit loose. Wow. And because of that, it doesn't contract and get the full bit inside of it normally would. Also because it is a scale model, the muscles are the full size, and the larger the muscles that get in the strain. And the final thing is because with basic physics, the torque of it, the farther it is for the greater the radius, the stronger it will be. And because it's a scale model, it's not that. And it's just a component of the strain because it's not straight visual. So it's just this angle cosine the normal strain. So it's just it's not as full strain. Also on a full scale model, I can have more individual air pockets, which would increase the conversion and the strain. Yeah. What was the cost of the upgraded servo? The newest servo, I think, got on Amazon for like 20, 25 bucks in that area. It wasn't too bad, so it's still one. So that's what it's going to be. How much would the full scale model be able to lift? If you buy it, both the full scale model, yeah. the full scale model can lift between 25 to 40 pounds, depending on the size of the muscles for the individual. And one of the problems is the way we have it now, we have to design it for individuals that climb measurements. And so each individual will have to look at a different amount. Um, if you were to put it on the market, how would you make it more portable? As it is, it'd be really cheap. Because when you put the objects in bulk, we got about 20 feet of the nylon mesh for 10 bucks, and like 50 feet of the inner tubing for like 20 bucks. So this whole thing, if we were to sell it, would cost about 20 bucks. And well, if, we also have to take into account the air compressor and the Arduino compressor. But if you're buying a bolt, they say we also need cheap. Yeah, we are continuing to make like um, a tricep and the way we like have just a limitation so that if it wasn't going to go too far or something, we just block the movement of it. But that'd be an extension of the project we build on, but not in the time frame we had. We could continue with the legs, we could use a lot of the same process. The problem is with the um, legs, because it's more like explosion rather than like contraction, and that's harder to deal with the actuators that we have. Okay. Um, so if you were to like wear this, where would you keep the servo thing? The servo goes on. But so we we think about having like a backpack we put everything in. And so it'd be kind of bulky and um inconvenient, but it would still work pretty well. But also if we further developed it, all that breadboard and everything could just be soldered and it would just basically be the chip and a bunch of wires just connected to the arm. We didn't weigh it, but it's pretty light. The carbon fiber is really strong for its weight, too. Um, I just want to comment. Um, as I'm sure most of you in here will find out in engineering school, there's like everything is more complicated and takes longer than you ever think it will. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say like, the fact that you guys were able to develop a working prototype is huge. Because, I mean, even in my program, when I go to the hospital, 
Um, physicians are expecting me to show them something that works because they want to see it, how they use it, how many use it, and you know, as good as like as proof of concepts are, they don't get you very far as far as like the actual real engineering world. So I just wanted to say, excellent job actually developing something that we can visualize here and actually see how it could potentially be used. Mm, that's good. Thanks, John. How much does it all weigh? Mm -hmm. Oh, like I say, we didn't wait, but the carbon fiber is really light, very strange. Would you guys want to continue working on this project together, even though you guys are going out to different schools? We, I mean, I suppose we can still like each other. It's like this is the kind of thing we both want to do in like careers, like how we go to prosthetics and that kind of field. So it's nice to have this as like a base, rather than like improve upon it in a new project or improving this one specifically. 